We really started, or I really started, thinking about stem cells as a postdoc. Um, the first stem cells, embryonic stem cells from the mouse, were isolated in the 1980s, and it quickly became apparent that this was going to be a revolutionary tool for making transgenic animals. But I don't think at the time it was totally appreciated how these stem cells from mouse would open the door to cell therapies. Um, and my interest really came from this uh, passion I have for unraveling the mechanistic underpinning pinnings of uh, mammalian gene expression programs during development and how these programs, um, when they go awry, can cause disease. So when I arrived as a postdoc, uh, I wanted to use embryonic stem cells to try to figure out why they have these attributes that make them so powerful in that they can self-renew, but they also have the potential to give rise to multiple cell types. And so just as a reminder, um, when we plate these cells in a dish, we're really freezing them in developmental time. And so that ability allows us to study uh, transcriptional regulation in a way that we may not be able to in a very transient cell population. And as Evan alluded to, um, at the time, I, I had no idea the importance of this work because it was just so exciting to me. I did, wasn't looking at the, the impact necessarily, but I came from a field of gene regulation and chromatin regulation, so I was uh, determined to find the transcription factors that really remarkably uh, maintain pluripotency and how you actually have to manipulate these nodes or these circuits in order to promote um, programming of specific cell fates. Well, I don't need to tell you how this has really opened the door for thinking about how small subsets of transcription factors drive cell identity in multiple cell types, and how now this type of, uh, analogous to this type of um, study, there are uh, a whole slew of research labs that have gone on to identify key transcription factors that are critical for other cell types. Um, and I think the important point of this slide is that I want to mention is that one of these sort of discoveries that we were able to show within this work is that these key transcription factors or transcription factors that drive cell identity are often autoregulatory, right? And so there's these feed-forward loops that actually promote maintenance of cell identity unless there's some way to perturb these circuits in order to direct them down different fates. So as I mentioned, you can take embryonic stem cells that we now know um, can be isolated from mouse, rodent, primates, um, including human and non-human primates. Um, and we are able to study in a dish very important processes that would be difficult to study otherwise, particularly, obviously, in human. So um, once we kind of identified these key circuits in embryonic stem cells, when I started my own lab, I wanted to understand how you would manipulate these circuits in order to drive differentiation. And we focused on the heart, which I'll tell you why we chose that system in a minute. Um, but I wanted to remind you first um, that this is becoming like some of the most powerful technology and methods in order to not only learn the molecular underpinnings of development, but also for potential cell therapies. So it is our goal, which I'm sure we share with all of you, where we can learn about each of the cell types in our body and what drives differentiation of those cell types, as well as homeostasis of those cell types within tissues to be able to engineer tissues or cells that can be used in therapy. But even on a more simpler level, um, it's been demonstrated a number of times where you can take patient cells and obviously generate iPS cells to study a variety of diseases, which is, again, illuminated key mechanistic insights that otherwise would not be possible. So with that, I'm going to talk today about some of the work that we've done in the heart. And we chose heart as a model system, and we use uh, not only mouse embryonic stem cells, but we're turning more to human iPS cells and even human ES cells, um, as well as using mouse as a model system for our work.
And one of the reasons why we chose to study differentiation or development of the heart is because, similar to um, the work that we did early on, we knew that it required very precise temporal regulation of genes during development. They have to be turned on at the right time and the right place. And even minor or subtle disruption of these programs can lead to congenital heart defects. And just to put that in perspective, every 15 minutes a baby is born with a congenital heart defect, um, which is the most common uh, cause of um, morbidity and mortality in uh, infants under the age of two. For those that survive, they often have uh, problems later in life, but these heart conditions commonly have a developmental component, and many of these components um, have not yet been elucidated. Um, and then just to illustrate the sensitivity of heart development to even subtle perturbations, there are a number of hemizygous mutations. So you need to just have one transcription factor mutated or slight changes in the levels of these transcription factors, and they can also contribute to congenital heart defects. So we reasoned that knowledge of the transcriptional mechanisms that drive this process cannot only illuminate fundamental mechanisms of gene regulation during development, but they may be very key for understanding the genetic culprits of uh, CHD, which for the most part we do not know what these genetic culprits are. And we may be able to use lessons learned from developmental biology uh, to leverage these lessons learned for regenerative medicine. So I'm gonna talk about two stories um, in the lab uh, over the last couple of years and give you a sense of how we're, again, using these studies or leveraging the information that we got from these studies to now move more towards uh, therapeutic uh, purposes. So I think I was inspired early on uh, by the sequencing of the human genome and the um, you know, whole genome sequencing of transcripts. And it was really striking that it was become clear that only 2% of our genome codes for protein coding genes, right? So there had been this debate um, early on that what is the rest of this DNA? Could we actually get rid of it and still be human? Well, it turns out that a good proportion of this DNA is regulatory and it's actually important for making us human. So uh, we started work early on uh, to try to define long non-coding RNAs, which had emerged as a new class of transcripts solely from our ability to be able to do genome-wide sequencing of transcripts. Um, and we wanted to understand whether or not these long non-coding RNAs had developmental roles. So for those of you who don't think about long non-coding RNAs every day, or link RNAs as I'll probably often refer to them, they are non-protein coding transcripts, longer than 200 nucleotides, and we classify them as longer than 200 nucleotides quite arbitrarily, and it's really just to separate them from the class of small non-coding RNAs that have more defined roles. Um, strangely, and I think this is still a conundrum in the field, they often have a 7-methylguanine cap. They can be spliced, meaning they're multi-exonic, and they can be polyadenylated, although not always. So you have this transcript um, that has exons and introns, it's regulated by polymerase II, yet it doesn't code for a protein. That's remarkable in the sense that it looks exactly like an mRNA, um, but yet it doesn't function like one. Um, what really caught our attention early on is that the few studies that were coming out suggested that they were regulators of gene expression. And that's been largely true for a lot of link RNAs, but not always. Um, and also that they dis display cell type expression patterns. And in fact, if you look across many transcriptome data sets, um, link RNAs appear to be more exclusively expressed com even compared to transcription factors. And then a real conundrum in the field that persists today um, and that we are trying to address is these non-coding RNAs are generally poorly conserved at the sequence level. So oftentimes you'll find a long non-coding RNA in mouse, and you can actually show that it has a really fundamental phenotype in your system, yet you can't find a homolog in human. So that's rather strange. Um, and it's true even for non-coding RNAs in human. Oftentimes there is no homolog in mouse or rat. But I think that we need to reevaluate how we talk about conservation of long non-coding RNAs.
because typically um, we've looked for syntenic homologies. It's not surprising that an RNA that doesn't code for a protein is not going to be highly conserved at the sequence level, and we'll get into that in a minute. But there may be particular RNA motifs or functionalities that are conserved, and that's one of the areas that we're really interested in continuing to pursue. So I'm just going to briefly interest, um, introduce you into how we identified a long line coding RNA in the heart. So our goal was to try to identify um, a long line coding RNA that would play a role in defining cell fate decisions during early heart development. In a lot of work that has been published, we basically um, performed an in silico and uh, computational analysis of a ton of different um, transcriptome data sets and identified a number of link RNAs that fulfilled our set of criteria and eventually settled on a long line coding RNA that's about 600 nucleotides, three exons, which for reasons you'll see in a moment that we named Braveheart. Um, and that actually turned out to be a very good choice of names because people remember it. Um, and so what we were able to show in the first work is that this long line coding RNA appears to work in trans um, as you can rescue the phenotype of loss of function by expressing it in uh, your cell type, which is actually very unusual um, the more we know about long line coding RNAs. It seems the vast majority seem to function in cis. Um, so what we are able to show is that Braveheart was necessary for differentiation of these uncommitted mesodermal cells or these early cardiac mesodermal uh, population of cells towards cardiac mesoderm and cardiac progenitors. So without Braveheart, even though it's expressed in ES cells, um, we cannot get expression of the who's who of the cardiovascular gene network. So at that point, we had no idea how it was functioning. We just knew that it was necessary. We were concerned that we couldn't find a syntenic transcript that exactly um, resembled Braveheart in human, but nevertheless, we believed that if something had such an important function, that we may be able to crack that paradox later on. And so as I mentioned, um, RNA structure is really, uh, I think, at the crux of some of the questions about RNA or link RNA conservation. Um, much like protein structure, you can actually have different constellations of amino acids that can form similar protein structures. But with RNA, it's even less rigid, and you really don't have many sequence requirements in order to form similar uh, secondary structures like stem loops. Um, the other reason why we got interested in RNA secondary structure for our long non-coding RNA is because in many cases, these non-coding RNAs uh, appeared to have regions or domains that had particular functions, suggesting that they could act as scaffolds for protein binding. And going back to the prokaryotic literature, this is certainly true. For example, ribozymes, et cetera, can bind metabolites and actually uh, perform important functions based on uh, the state of the cell. Also, RNA structure of at least longer RNAs can be very modular and hierarchical. So you can get the idea that perhaps uh, a single long non coding RNA can perform multiple functions. And there, there is evidence of this by the fact that there is a single uh, link RNA that can bind two different proteins or tether proteins together in two different complexes. And so with um, this hypothesis that perhaps the structure of Braveheart is important and not the sequence, we went ahead and performed some chemical probing. And the reason why we did this is because generally, although there are vast improvements in this area, you cannot predict secondary structure of longer uh, RNAs. And so we performed some experimental probing um, and some computational predictions. And we took advantage of the shape uh, platform where it's called selective two prime hydroxyl acylation analyzed by primer extension. And there will be a quiz on this later. Um, but essentially, it takes advantage of the common functionality of all RNAs, the two prime hydroxyl group, and whether or not uh, an RNA is base paired or in a flexibly conformational position dictates whether or not it has accessibility to specific probes. And so using this methodology, as well as shotgun um, shape, 
and determining the structures as well as DMS footprinting, we were able to identify a structure that best fit our data. I don't want to say that this is the only structure, but it is certainly the structure that best fit our data. Um, but essentially, as you can um, see in this diagram, uh, we have multiple motifs, multiple structures, and when we searched a database of RNA structural elements, we were able to show that we could find many of these elements represented in other RNAs. Okay. Um, and for example, we could find five-way junctions, we could find stem loops, but there was one uh, motif that really stuck out to us, and it's this asymmetric uh, G-rich loop over here. Uh, you can see that it has a, a big single-stranded loop here with a smaller one on this side. And when we searched a number of databases, um, this particular structure was very underrepresented. I don't want to give you the impression that we only then did functional analysis on this particular motif as we actually performed analysis on many of these, but I'm going to focus on this agile motif, um, which is a symmetric G-rich internal loop, um, because it gave us the most striking phenotype. And one thing that I want to just point out to you here is this loop is only 11 nucleotides, whereas the entire transcript is 600 nucleotides. So what we did is <clears throat> we used CRISPR-Cas9 and we made precise deletions in this agile motif, um, which is an exon one, as you can see here. And that was not so easy because you can obviously use um, non-homologous end joining to make kind of random uh, loss of uh, nucleotides in the specific regions, but we needed to make a precise mutation, so we used homology-directed repair with a template that did not have these 11 nucleotides. Um, and so then we had to also show, by repeating the shape probing, that we could remove this loop and the rest of the structure remained intact. And that's also very important for determining functionality. Um, I also want to show you that um, here I'm showing you two clones that we made in ES cells that Braveheart is expressed normally by Northern um, and also um, it's expressed normally using qPCR. And similar to what we observed in our initial Braveheart knockdown studies, it does not uh, impinge on uh, ES cell uh, quality or, or um, a f a phenotype. And so the, now the question is, does loss of this 11 nucleotides impact the function of Braveheart similarly to loss of the entire transcript? And for this, we um, employed a embryonic stem cell differentiation protocol where we could use the timed addition of various growth factors to drive cells from the ES cell to the mesoderm, to the cardiac progenitor, and finally to the cardiomyocyte stage. And if this works, you can see we can get a nice um, dish of beating cardiomyocytes at day 10. Um, and the wonderful thing about this protocol is it really follows a pretty good temporal uh, timeline where we can isolate these cells and analyze them in terms of their functionality. And so, um, we can then, these ES cells actually have NKX 2.5, which is expressed at um, the cardiac progenitor phase, and so it uh, drives GFP expression. So we can actually use GFP in this case to determine whether or not these cells can differentiate into cardiac progenitors. And what I'm showing you in red is the Braveheart knockout, and in black is the wild type. And during differentiation, we usually get 70 to 80 percent um, cardiac progenitors and cardiomyocytes. You can see that that looks good in the wild type. However, we cannot get um, NKX 2.5 GFP expressing cells in the Braveheart mutant. And not surprisingly, we also can't uh, observe cardiomyocytes as evidenced by cardiac troponin T staining. So that suggested to us that um, it has a striking phenotype that recapitulates uh, what we saw with complete loss of the 600 nucleotide transcript. And so as I mentioned, these cells seem to get stuck at this stage, at this stage, the mesoderm stage. And what we had shown previously with our knockdown is that may be due to the inability to shut down brachyuri and to promote progression of differentiation by activation of the who's who of transcription factors. So as you can see here, day four is um, 
the mesoderm stage, and day 5.3 is the progenitors. Um, in the normal case, you would have uh, brachiuria expressed about this level. You see really high levels as if they're piling up at this stage, and you still maintain expression at what should be the progenitor stage. And again, in our Braveheart knockout, we can see good expression of all of the transcription factors that are known to drive cardiomyocyte um, differentiation and cardiac commitment. However, in our mutant, we don't see expression of these. So again, the transcript is there, the only difference is this loop. So what is this loop doing? So we went through a number of assays to try to determine how it was functioning um, or how the link RNA in general is functioning. And I won't tell you about all of the failed experiments. I will tell you about the experiment that worked and actually gave us some insights into how it could be functioning. So as I mentioned at the beginning, long mancuding RNAs uh, have been shown a number of times to interact with proteins, and that's not surprising because we know that a lot of complexes are ribonucleic acid uh, complexes. And so uh, a lot of uh, folks in the field were actually using link RNA combined with mass spec to try to identify proteins that were binding to their favorite long mancuding RNA. However, we don't prefer this method for people who are working in this field because generally our link RNAs are expressed at fairly low levels. And when you do this sort of IP mass spec, you just get a ton of RNA binding proteins and it really doesn't give you any sense of specificity. So we ran into that several times. And so then we turned to this assay where we used these human protoarrays. And there's a reason why we use the human protoarrays. One, because the mouse wasn't as well developed, but two, we reasoned that if we could actually find proteins that um, this agile motif in human, that are bound by this agile motif in human, it may start to give us some insights into potentially conserved functions in human. So essentially there are uh, about 10,000 full length recombinant proteins that are printed on these arrays. We can take our long non coding RNA, both wild type and mutant, and probe these arrays, and then ask what is specifically bound. And um, we have the benefit of also being able to look across a number of data sets using a similar protocol. So we immediately removed any proteins that showed up in all data sets, um, and we removed proteins that we knew weren't expressed in our cell type. And we came up with this short list. And as you can see, there are several proteins, um, for example, HNRNPF and uh, SFRS9, which are splicing factors. And we do have some evidence that there may be something going on with Braveheart with these factors, but for this study, we focused on a protein called CNBP. And what's CNBP? Well, CNBP um, is a, a zinc finger um, transcription factor, if you will. It binds to single-stranded DNA and RNA, and um, it's also known as cellular nucleic acid uh, binding protein, or ZNF9. And the really interesting thing about CNBP, it, or ZNF9, it is the only protein that has been implicated in myotonic dystrophy type 2. And in many of these patients, they have heart defects, and we know that um, uh, ZNF9 can actually contribute to that. And the other really interesting part of uh, what's been known about CNBP before we got to studying it is it likes to bind G-rich sequences. And as I showed you uh, in our Agile motif, that is a G-rich loop, single-stranded G-rich loop. And one of the mechanisms that uh, CNBP is thought to perform and this is still, you know, I would say needs additional uh, attention, is that it likes to bind to regulatory regions where you can actually get R loops or G quadruplexes, which is a specialized structure that happens um, when, for example, uh, DNA and RNA or triplexes actually come together. Um, and this type of structure can be very important for regulating transcription. And I'll get back to that in a minute. So the first thing we needed to show is whether or not CNBP even has a functional role in our system. So using CRISPR again, we generated knockouts. We showed that we could get complete loss of the protein. However, um, uh, that did not affect uh, Braveheart. In the Braveheart knockout, Agile knockout, we didn't affect CNBP levels. And in the double knockout, we still see it. 
And so we were surprised. I don't think we knew what to expect with the CNBP knockout because there really isn't much shown about its phenotype in the literature that instead of actually impacting um, differentiation negatively, it actually made the cells more, I don't know, free to differentiate. It seemed like they were uh, had a much better ability to differentiate than wild type cells, suggesting that CMBP might be some kind of negative regulator of the program. You have to kind of pass the threshold of a CMBP gate in order to efficiently differentiate into cardiomyocytes. And again, we measured this using NKX 2.5 as a measure of the cardiac progenitors and cardiac troponin T for um, the cardiomyocytes. And as you can see here, consistent with this idea that you're actually getting more robust or efficient differentiation, um, we're getting, uh, we observe higher levels of uh, NKX 2.5 as well as some of the other transcription factors that are known to be very important for differentiation of these cells. So it's almost like it's skewing these cells to completely go towards the cardiomyocyte lineage. I don't want to say that it's doing it better, I would just say that you also get partial differentiation. You only usually get 70 to 80%. Now we're getting uh, much more efficient differentiation. Um, and so the question, um, and you can see that here too in cardiomyocytes, the question is now what happens um, when CB, CNBP and Braveheart are knocked out? So I show you that the agile mutant um, leads to complete loss of differentiation, but loss of CNBP actually leads to more efficient differentiation. So one would um, surmise that a double knockout might ask, actually rescue the Braveheart Agile mutant phenotype. Um, and that's exactly what we see. So we generated the double knockout cells. And you can see here for immunostaining, because I think looking at immunostaining is always uh, much more helpful than just showing qPCR. You can see in the wild type here, we're staining for cardiac troponin T at the end of our differentiation protocol. Um, in the wild type, we see plenty of cardiac troponin T, as you would expect. Um, we don't see any in the Braveheart Agile uh, knockout cells, but yet in the double mutant, we do see some rescue of cardiac troponin T. And you can actually see that here again, where the gray is wild type, you don't see the red for the Braveheart um, Agile knockout because you don't get expression of any of these. And then we, again, observe some pretty good rescue of the cardiomyocyte markers here with the double knockout. So that was really interesting to us because um, this was the first study that showed a particular motif in a long non-coding RNA and a very small motif could actually interact with a protein um, and antagonize the effects of those proteins um, to promote differentiation. And food for thought, this is a model that we have. We don't, you know, we're currently testing it, but I think it's exciting to think about because the more we learn about the genome and genome structure, the more clear it's become that it's not just how transcription factors bind to DNA or chromatin, but that DNA can actually adopt interesting conformations locally that also impinge on whether things bind or whether transcription um, can happen. So I mentioned these G quadruplexes or G4 sequences, and they're basically um, G-rich regions that are stacked on top of one, in, one another in a planar type structure held together by Hoostein hydrogen bonding. And the cool thing about these G4 structures is they can form between DNA and RNA. And as I mentioned, um, the Agile uh, motif is a single-stranded G-rich sequence. And we've done some circular dichroism that uh, provides evidence that this G-rich motif can um, engage in these G4 um, complexes. And so our current model that we are testing using a number of methods is that um, Braveheart, through its Agile motif, can antagonize CNBP at certain genes, and that this may affect the formation or resolution of some of these G quadruplex structures, um, thereby influencing gene expression patterns. And just as a little bit of um, interesting evidence that G quadruplexes um, do play important roles in gene regulation, and in particular in cardiac regulation, NKX 2.5 uh, has been shown to also be regulated by some G quadruplex um, 
uh, formation as well. So those have to be resolved and regulated in order for NKX 2.5 to be expressed normally. So we're pursuing this avenue, but we don't want to, um, you know, obviously put our eggs all in one basket. So we're still trying to determine whether or not uh, Braveheart is actually functioning at different levels and whether other motifs are performing other functions. So in summary for this part, um, you know, I showed you that we have this interesting long non-coding RNA that appears to work in trans. How it regulates specific genes over others is still uh, not known, and we are working on that. But again, it's difficult when you're studying a long non-coding RNA that's generally lowly expressed. Um, and uh, CNBP, on the other hand, is expressed more abundantly or um, and ubiquitously. So how Braveheart is interacting with CNBP at particular genes it's still not clear to us. And it could actually have to do with those genes that have the propensity or those sequences that have the propensity to form these G quadruplex structures. So currently, um, the proof is always when you can show an organismal phenotype for a long encoding RNA. So we have made these mice and we're currently breeding them and we just got our first homozygous. I can tell you that they're at least not embryonic lethal. Um, but we suspect that there are some interesting developmental defects and we'll have more on that soon. Um, again, as I mentioned, we need to know how Braveheart is recruited to specific genomic sites. But really the um, important aspect of this that I'm really intrigued by is again this lack of conservation. So I mentioned that we couldn't find a syntenic homolog for Braveheart. Um, however, we did find that it interacts with CNBP, which is a highly conserved protein. And it's a highly conserved protein that has functions in myotonic dystrophy and cardiac um, disease in both mouse and human. And so we thought that perhaps if we could identify RNAs that interact with CNBP in human, in similar cell types, these cardiac progenitors, because you can differentiate human iPS cells to cardiomyocytes, perhaps we would begin to identify potential homologs uh, of this um, Braveheart uh, and, or this motif. And so just as a primer for that, um, we uh, took um, CMBP and we performed CLIP experiments, which basically tell you exactly where your protein of interest is binding. Um, and then we sequenced these and analyzed the top motif, and the top motif was exactly that of Braveheart. Um, and so now we've identified the RNAs uh, that have this motif in our human population of cells that are similar to the mouse, and we're investigating the function of these long encoding RNAs as well. So hopefully that this will illustrate that you can't just look at syntony and sequence conservation when thinking about functional conservation of particular long non-coding RNAs. So we learned something about ESL differentiation into cardiomyocytes, and we think some of this certainly recapitulates normal uh, mammalian development, and we're working towards um, combining those tools um, and, and actually trying to understand the organismal phenotype for long non-coding RNAs, as well as other mechanisms that we've uncovered. But one of the things that we've also become quite passionate about is how can you use gene expression programs and the ability, ability to rewire these programs, um, as well as chromatin modulation, to stimulate cardiac regeneration? Well, why are we interested in that? So a number of years ago, really it was kind of the shot heard around the world in terms of regenerative biology of the heart, um, it was shown that um, neonatal mouse and rat hearts um, could regenerate similar to zebrafish, whereas adult hearts cannot. And prior to this study, it was uh, thought that perhaps um, this ability was lost in man mammals because zebras, zebrafish, um, can completely regenerate their ha hearts, but nobody seemed to be able to find evidence that that was true in mammals. However, these careful studies looking at different time points postnatally highlighted a very sensitive developmental window of time, whereas these cells can actually regenerate very similarly to zebrafish. And this is huge because now if we can understand the process, 
of why these cells initially can regenerate in response to injury, but then determine the molecular roadblocks that then prevent um, regeneration in the adult. That might be a game changer for being able to promote proliferation of these cells in response to injury. So I just wanted to point um, these modes of regeneration out because I think that the heart is, again, a really interesting organ on a number of levels. So there are different ways that tissues regenerate. There are many tissues, including, for example, blood, um, where you have a progenitor or a, a population of stem cells that are quiescent that get activated, and then they produce more cells, and similar to the gut. And then you have some cases where you can get transdifferentiation of one cell to another, and that replenishes cell types in that tissue. And then there is this sort of less well-studied um, model of regeneration where you can actually get de-differentiation or turning back the developmental clock of a particular cell and then re-differentiation of that cell type um, to re-establish homeostasis in a particular tissue type in response to disease or injury. So this is potentially how the heart regenerates. And this is important because for many years, it's been a huge controversy in the field as to whether the heart contains a population of stem cells that promote regeneration. And by and large, this does not appear to be true. That doesn't mean that there are other types of progenitor or stem cells like epicardial progenitors, et cetera, that actually are important for homeostasis in the heart. But there does not appear to be an adult stem cell population that contributes directly to um, restoration of cardiomyocyte loss in response to injury or disease. So all, point, all, all signs point to this really interesting dedifferentiation phenotype, and that's been shown in zebrafish. Um, and now I think that there's substantial evidence that that also occurs in um, the human heart. And so one of the things that we did early on is we guessed, well, if this is true, if you're turning back the developmental clock, then you would guess that in response to injury, then you would see a transcriptional reversion of the gene expression program in those cells in a temporal manner. Without going through too much um, of this data, because this work is also published, um, we found that if you analyze the neonatal um, cardiomyocytes that we isolate from, from mice, you can see, as shown in yellow, you get a really nice pattern of gene expression that completely agrees with the, um, the maturation and the biological changes that uh, happen during the normal process of maturation. So for example, toward the end of maturation and in the adult, you get a higher expression of uh, mitochondrial um, proteins as well as sarcomere components. And that's because at this point, the sarcomeres become quite rigid um, and uh, uh, less able to uh, proliferate. So I'm just gonna show you a few examples of what we found when we actually did these resections and then analyzed uh, RNA expression. And at the top is um, what happens during maturation. I'm just showing you a few uh, categories of genes that we identified. For example, these cell cycle genes decrease during maturation, sarcomere components increase, and um, for reasons I'll get to in a minute, there's some chromatin regulators that decrease, but we also saw chromatin regulators that show the opposite pattern. So as you would expect, if this is really a transcriptional reversion that's at least in part driving this, um, um, the cells to turn back their developmental clock, you would see the opposite expression pattern. And um, this is what I am showing here in response to injury. So that gave us the idea, what is driving these changes, right? And they're all very important changes in the sense that these cells now have a gene expression program that more mimics an immature uh, cardiomyocyte that has the ability to proliferate. So I just wanted to remind you that during maturation, because this is gonna make sense in a minute, you get a dramatic, uh, dramatic biological changes that happen. So um, these cells, when um, first born, you go from um, proliferation to a hypertrophic mode of growth um, these cells start off to be mononucleated, and then they become binucleated in rodents um, and often polyploid in human. 
Interestingly, you get this major change in metabolism that also happens. You go from using glucose as a primary carbon source to fatty acid beta oxidation. And then obviously in this state, you have regenerative potential. However, in this state, you do not. And so understanding the molecular mediators of these transitions, again, may give us particular pathways and proteins um, and genes and or RNAs to manipulate so that we can prevent this maturation or perhaps um, at will turn back the developmental clock in response to particular injuries. So the first thing that we did, because we love chromatin, and um, so we can't sort of get away with it without it, is that there's an observation across differentiation in all cell types that there are dramatic changes in chromatin structure. Obviously, you go from being more open chromatin to more heterochromatinized as you um, go into the uh, differentiated state. And there are so many different chromatin remodelers and modifiers, and these all play very important roles in organizing the genome, um, and for that matter, in any DNA-mediated process. But we wanted to look at those chromatin regulators that played important roles in driving these chromatin changes um, during differentiation. And our idea was to identify changes in chromatin that may actually prevent this maturation process. So um, uh, what I'm not going to show you is that our Novartis collaboration, but I will show you we design, developed this uh, platform where we could take um, isolated cardiomyocytes from mice at many different stages. I'm just showing you for P1 here. And we could use either compounds or siRNAs to our favorite um, chromatin um, remodeling proteins and then analyze using a number of different markers the effects on these cells and then to study these in a more mechanistic way um, both in vivo, ex vivo and um, in vitro. And so I just wanted to tell you that um, isolation of cardiomyocytes um, from neonates anyway is pretty straightforward and you can actually plate them and they can re recapitulate many of the functions of the in vivo cardiomyocytes. What's really great about these cells is they're highly transfectable and you can use them for cell and molecular biology. So using this platform, um, we designed a number of siRNAs to chromatin components that we knew were upregulated or might play important roles in differentiation based on the literature. And so what I'm showing you here is our control pool of siRNAs, and then I have two positive controls here, CRIM1 and MIS1. And um, these proteins upon knockdown or knockout, uh, both in ex vivo uh, cultures as well as in animals, have been shown to stimulate cardiomyocyte proliferation. And pretty much to the same exact extent that we see here. So looking across all of these different regulators, you know, DNA methyltransferases, histone modifiers, ATP-dependent regulators. We found um, one particular gene that codes for RUVBL2 that seemed to reproducibly increase proliferation when knocked down in these ex vivo cells comparatively to our positive controls. And here you can see that we get really good knockdown. Um, importantly, as I mentioned, this maturation is a progression. And so in P1, if you resect the hearts, they're really good at regenerating. But as you start to get to P4, it's um, much more difficult for these cells to proliferate. So we wanted to be able to show that knockdown of our favorite component here um, compared to the positive controls was not only able to stimulate proliferation in P1, but also P4. And uh, for that matter, we also wanted to show that um, uh, knockdown of our uh, candidate here does not create a global increase in proliferation of fibroblasts because that would be nonspecific and not very helpful because the last thing you want to do in response to injury is to promote proliferation of fibroblasts and uh, scar formation. So um, our evidence suggests that simply knocking down RUVBL2 in these ex vivo cardiomyocytes did stimulate proliferation. Um, we have evidence that they also promote cytokinesis, um, but they do so more specifically in cardiomyocytes than in fibroblasts. Um, we could then knock down uh, RUBBL2 and analyze the gene expression changes, and this was really exciting to us because um, it showed that 
perhaps Rav BL2 really has some specificity for regulating this metabolic transition that's observed in the neonates to adult. So for example, um, when you knock down Rav BL2, what we observe is upregulation of glucose and NAD metabolism, and that's exactly what you would expect if you were turning back the developmental clock. Um, and there are a number of other uh, pathways here that is exactly what you would expect from more early or neonatal cells. And um, in contrast, you actually see downregulation of sarcomere components and cytoskeletal components, et cetera. And we know that for these cardiomyocytes to be able to proliferate and undergo cytokinesis to some extent, you need to dis disassemble the sarcomeres. So this really suggests and is in line with the fact that we are seeing an increase in proliferation and potentially uh, finding um, a really key nodal point that can control the transition from neonate to adult. So what is RUVBL2? That's the burning question. Well, um, as I mentioned, it was chosen originally because it was part of, of the chromatin remodeling family. Well, RUVBL2, as well as its homolog RUVBL1, are AAA plus ATPases, and they're commonly catalytic components of chromatin regulatory, regulatory complexes. So they form these heterohexameric rings, but they can also form homohexameric rings. And they're very important um, in a number of processes, including epigenetic regulation. Um, RUBBL1 and 2 have been shown to be important in cancer cell proliferation, mitotic spindle assembly, and stress responses and cellular signaling. And this was really interesting to us because um, this suggested that we might have found something um, new or a new uh, mechanism uh, for understanding how these cells mature and then how we can actually perturb this maturation um, by targeting um, these complexes. What's also really interesting is this pa paper here was published like 16 years ago. Reptin and pontin are the zebrafish homologs of RUVBL1 and 2 and it was shown that they antagonistically regulate heart growth in zebrafish. So we felt like we were on the right track. And again, as I mentioned, these proteins are structural components of many chromatin remodeling complexes. We still have a lot to sort out in how exactly RUVBL2 is controlling um, this process of maturation and exit from the cell cycle. Uh, but we have uh, generated now conditional knockout ES cells that we can differentiate, and we're also making the mice, and we're doing a number of biochemical studies. But one of the things that I wanted to point out that it's kind of interesting came full circle in the lab is this RUBBL1 and RUBBL2, as I mentioned, they form these rings that are important for the assembly and function of a number of ATP-dependent chromatin remodelers. In particular, I'm showing you two chromatin remodelers here, P400 and TIP60, as well as SRCAT, that are critical for histone variant exchange. So what that means is these complexes, they function at promoter regions and also other regulatory regions to take out core histone H2A and to replace it with a variant that's more amenable to transcriptional regulation. And we've actually spent years studying H2AZ in our lab, so it was really interesting and unexpected that this may have come full circle. And now we're trying to understand um, how um, these complexes, partially through RUVBL2, uh, might be important for regulating H2AZ exchange at critical promoters during uh, the maturation process. So that's one of our current hypotheses. And I just want to um, also tell you about some of our previous work where we showed that H2AZ is absolutely essential for the induction of gene expression. So for example, in ES cells without H2AZ, these cells cannot respond to developmental cues or any other type of cue. So it cannot induce expression of genes um, when signaled to do so. So it may be important as cells are maturing, they're getting signals um, from neighboring cells, et cetera, without H2AZ or proper exchange of H2AZ through loss of RUVBL2, perhaps these genes cannot um, respond to those cues properly. So that's just one of our models. We have other models, but I think it's really interesting to think about how chromatin regulation, 
um, may actually be an important target point for thinking about regeneration. So ongoing questions, uh, we're still trying to figure out what RevBL1 and RevBL2 are doing. Um, and obviously sort of the holy grail is can we reprogram cardiac sulfate uh, to stimulate this proliferation and or cytokinesis by manipulating these epigenetic um, pathways or transcription factor networks. And one area that we've spent a lot of time thinking about lately is because there's really a lot of crosstalk between metabolism, chromatin regulation, and gene expression. How are these all related in order to promote this really interesting maturation process? And what are the nodal points that we might be able to go after in the future? Not only to understand uh, mechanisms of normal development, but also um, in some disease states and also to identify potential targets for therapy. And I want to just point out, interestingly enough, there is a small molecule um, that was developed against RevBL2, and it's in trials for cancer. Um, so um, that suggests that perhaps um, we will be able to use that as a tool also in some of our studies. Um, so just in closing, because I know time is running late, um, given that this is a stem cell consortium, I want to put in my two cents because the field has, uh, you know, grown substantially and there is a lot of diversity in the protocols and the endpoints that people use in experiments. And this is particularly important for cell therapy and when you're differentiating human iPS cells or disease lines toward particular cell states. I think there's been an overall lack of quality control metrics. Um, not for iPS cells themselves, there's been a lot of attention given to that, but in terms of functional attributes that we can measure for end-stage iPS differentiated cells. And so we're actually designing and developing a number of tools that, for example, will avoid having to use patch clamp of single cells, so that when we're differentiating iPS cells towards specific types of cardiac cells, using electrophysiology um, by uh, imaging techniques, we'll be able to highlight what cells are what, um, and also looking at calcium transients, um, we're also looking at gene expression um, programs because, and force of contraction, et cetera, because this is really critical if you want to use any of these cells for cell therapy. And I think ultimately defining label-free um, quality control attributes is going to be necessary to ever get cells um, in bulk for any kind of cell therapy. So um, with that, that's kind of my two cents. Um, we're also working on organoids. Again, there has to be some kind of um, quality control metrics for how we define organoids because now everyone is making organoids, but they will differ in terms of cell-to-cell -cell interactions as well as the cell types used. So I think it's going to be difficult to compare data across uh, labs who are using sort of similar organoid techniques unless there's some normalization that can be applied to these types of technologies. So with that, um, I think um, it's really important that we continue to develop the next generation of tools, not only for disease modeling and drug screening, but um, one of the papers that we were involved with with Linda Griffith's lab recently is actually making this 10-way organ, organoid system to try to understand how stem cells that are differentiated in all these different organ systems actually communicate with each other um, within a common circulation. So basically, if you were to treat with a drug, with this type of technology, you can understand how that drug is going to impact each of these different organ systems. And so I think that's part of the, the dream of using these organoids and iPS cells to really understand how a drug impacts um, systemically, um, but also, um, again, we need new tools and new quality control attributes, um, potentially if we're going to think about using stem cells um, for transplantation. So with that, as I said, uh, science is collaboration, and I wouldn't be here with all, all my wonderful collaborators. Um, and we are so grateful to all of the folks that have funded us over the years. I, I'm not this flush with money, don't get the wrong impression. <laughs> this is over like in the last 11 years. But without um, the support uh, from these folks, uh, we would not have been able to do what we do.
And so with that, I will take questions. So, so regarding the interaction between CNBP and the AJA, uh, would it be possible to try some kind of an MPRA where you add more agile features to specific reporter link RNA or something like that just to see if is there like um, kind of a dose response in the amount of protein to the amount of, of this, um, this motif? So the question is whether or not we can um, quantify the interaction features better between Braveheart and CNBP or this Agile motif. Um, probably it, you're, you're kind of alluding to classical protein interaction studies where you can find maybe a KD, et cetera. One of the things that we're doing right now is we're trying to um, narrow down the region of CNBP where um, Braveheart potentially interacts. We believe it's a direct interaction based on our array studies because there's no other factors there other than CMBP on the array and our Braveheart. Um, and so I think narrowing down um, though that motif in CMBP will also help us to kind of um, model structurally how it might interact. Um, I would imagine that Braveheart is interacting pretty closely with that loop Otherwise, um, if it was interacting with another part of um, the link RNA, then the loop alone may not give the complete phenotype. Um, so yeah, but we are doing those studies. And I think the circular dichroism too, because we will ultimately use CNBP with that as well. Um, and some BACOR measurements that we're trying to do as well may give us some sense of what the KD is. I don't know how important that's gonna be. Because if it's a gene-specific effect, as long as it can get there and there's enough of it, I think we're okay. Thank you so much for coming and share with us your, your work. It's actually really good to see this. Um, you, you mentioned that the, CNB, the CNBD um, antagonizes the knockout improves differentiation. And what I didn't get a sense are is what type of myocyte you're getting. Are you getting exclusively ventricular myocyte? Because I know certain protocols currently, they tend to generate exclusively ventricular myocyte. So did you get a sense of what type of myocyte? My second question is, um, you also showed that the, uh, the Braveheart can antagonize CNBD action. Um, did you get a sense of, there's, there's now an ex, uh, some efforts in um, generating not only cardi cardiac myocytes, but also cardiac fibroblast, um, potentially to try to mimic a m much more um, biological milieu to sort of mimic the heart, um, perhaps to improve function maturation. Um, did you get a sense of whether um, Braveheart or even CNDB could bias cell a lineage towards the cardiac fibroblast, cardiac fibroblast lineage? We haven't tested anything in cardiac fibroblasts, and I think your point is well taken. So the question is um, whether or not um, the interaction between Braveheart and CNBP is driving cells toward a particular type of cardiomyocyte, because as you point out, there are ventricular atrial cardiomyocytes, and these differentiation protocols don't give you sort of an e equal distribution of all of these different cardiomyocytes. I would say they're largely ventricular. We didn't actually um, measure what proportion of um, these cells are specific types of cardiomyocytes, but we can show by cardiac troponin T, which is a more generic measurement, we usually get about 80% um, uh, of these cells in the culture and that they can form cystitium and beat. Um, but I think another point that you bring up, which is something that we're following up on, is that it's possible that loss of um, CNBP actually drives you to a different type of cardiomyocyte. And that is something that we're actually looking at um, because even though it seems that Braveheart may antagonize CNBP and we do get restoration of C um, cardiac troponin T levels, that doesn't necessarily mean we're getting that exact same cell. So we are looking to see whether or not um, there is any skewing at all, right? Because there may be other proteins that Braveheart is interacting with or antagonizing that we haven't found yet, 
that could be specific to ventricular versus atrial, et cetera. So we are carefully actually going back to our ES differentiation protocols and trying to define exactly what the cell types are, um, and even the subtle differences in, in those cultures. And that's gonna even be even more important for the human differentiation protocols. And just for clarification, this work was done primarily in mouse CSL, correct? Yes. So you haven't um, tried the, some of the human pluripotent stem cell differentiation? We have done a lot of human IPS differentiations for different projects, but we are actually, we use the IPS differentiation to do the ECLIP, right, to define targets in the progenitor population where we know it's critical for Braveheart to potentially identify homologs structurally that might behave in the same way. So now we're going back and manipulating some of those long line coding RNAs in the human system to determine their function in that system. Could you, could you comment on the maturity of the cardiomyocytes? You know, the uh, generally believe that they're not mature. And towards the end, you were showing slides for toxicity and so on. Um, how do you tackle that problem? So I don't think that problem has been tackled by anyone yet. Um, and then this is pervasive in the field of stem cell biology or IPS uh, differentiation, that the inability to achieve mature cell types has really been a bottleneck in the field. And uh, my uh, thinking on that is because when we're differentiating these cells, they don't have any of their buddies that they would normally have in vivo. And so we need to figure out how interactions with other cells, why organoids might actually uh, facilitate this maturation, um, or the factors that are important for um, promoting these cells to be terminally differentiated. And again, my thinking is it's really going to be um, interactions with uh, different cell types that signal to these cells to be terminally differentiated. And that's gonna be hard to achieve just by doing IPS differentiations of single cell types. Um, however, um, interestingly enough, like Chuck Murray's lab and others have shown that if you just leave these cardiomyocytes that are IPS derived in a dish for like a year, they actually behave more maturely. So there may be things that are happening um, to the programs that are causing that maturity. But in terms of maturity, like we're defining that by very few markers. Is it the same maturity as you would see in an adult heart? Do they function the same? That's not clear. So I think we're still um, at a crossroads in the field and um, we will definitely need to develop, as I mentioned, quality control metrics to determine um, the maturation state of these cells. And there's actually a lot of interesting reasons why sometimes looking at less mature cells is ideal more so than terminally differentiated cells because you wanna also understand whether or not these cells have some kind of intrinsic plasticity that you can exploit for different reasons. And even for cell therapy, maybe you want them to be a little less than mature because when they actually can home to particular regions in a tissue, um, they will get those signals and they may have a better ability to integrate within um, that tissue.